So we have Aileen Lee, who's the founder and managing partner of Cowboy Ventures, Sukinder Singh Cassidy, president of StubHub and founder of the Boardlift, and Megan Smith, who is CEO of Shift7 and the third US chief technology officer of the United States of America. <laughs> So, um, so I want to, I don't know where to start. Let me start with you, Aileen. <laughs> okay. Uh, you and I did a podcast, and one of the things you said on it that I, it really struck me, and actually a lot of listeners, was the good guy thing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Let's start talking about the, the problem itself, and each of you, I want to think about what the problem itself is. And I really do want to talk about solutions, because we all know the numbers, they suck. Um, let's start with that, because I thought that was fascinating from you. Okay. Hi. Um, so I have a problem with the saying that a lot of people use, which is called, he's such a good guy. Um, and if you pay attention to it from now on, you'll notice how often people say it, which is, you know, you're sitting around a board table, let's say if a company is doing well, they're thinking about their next round of funding, and we usually make a, a spreadsheet of who we're going to call for the Series B or the Series C, and usually it's a bunch of guys sitting around the table and I'm the only woman. And someone will be like, oh, what about, you know, Jeff Smith? And then someone else will be like, oh, he's such a good guy. I love that guy. And then someone else will say, you know, what about, you know, what about Ben Jones? We're like, oh, I love that dude. What a good dude. And then I'll say, well, you know, what about Sukinder or Megan? They'll be like, oh, does she invest in security? Uh, and the, the, the conversation and the questions you get when, because they don't know her, um, and the, he's such a good guy, has nothing to do about, with whether he should join the board, whether he's going to add value to the company, whether he knows the right customers or the technology or their product or has the expertise, but that's the qualification for how a lot of people get invited into investing in companies or getting hired into roles. And the questions that people ask around women candidates or people of color or people who are different or people who are unknown are completely different. So it bugs me. Yeah. And I would like us to not use it anymore. Okay. Nobody use it. That's it. Okay. Nice. So nice. let's just define what we're, what you guys are each are, you're doing to do this. Talk, talk about your three things. Let me start. Uh, let's start. So Kinder, because Boardless has been around the yeah. longest. Yeah. A, a couple of years. So yeah. the Boardlist is a talent marketplace uh, to solve the problem of uh, there are no good women for my board. <laughs> right. Where are all the good women? Uh, so it's, I mean, it's a curated marketplace that where CEOs and senior executives with board experience nominate great people for board service, and companies come and search. And it's a binder, binder, right, full of women. Uh, it's it's more than a binder. It is a marketplace, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes, to answer your question, like 2,500 women, uh, 500 board seats, 150 placements. There are plenty of good women, right? And the concept but it's meant is to solve that, that boards that are the easiest, probably the low hanging fruit in terms of getting an attracting for sure dif a different board for sure because boards are not only low-hanging fruit they're the white space for private companies uh, people think of board seats as high risk I think of them as actually a great way to get introduced to talent particularly in a private company where you can set the term uh, and figure out if somebody's a great fit uh, pure white space easy to do um, and the start of the board list is I think uh, we once talked about was a number of tier one VCs coming in to see me to ask me when I was a founder myself what should we do Sukinder about the problem of women in the valley and I said you could solve 100% of the culture problems in the Valley today if you put a woman on every board of Several. every Series B company and beyond. Yeah. So let's go. Yeah. So, so when you think about that, because it's interesting, because boards, one of the things that I've, I've said this a number of times is um, when it comes to boards, it, there's plenty of talent. There's lots. Of, you can argue all you want yes. about other talent, but boards, there's plenty of people yep, to plenty pick from. And one of the stories I did many years ago was one on the Twitter board. I started off that, why are there 10 white men on this mm -hmm. board? Like, I just want to understand it. You remember that piece? I remember. And I think it's the single great, I could have retired after this lead I did, which <laughs> I thought was the best lead of all time, where, uh, and, uh, and I was writing about this fact. It's like it's mathematically impossible that mm -hmm. this is how it ended up. And I said, here on the board of Twitter, which has three Peters and a dick. And <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's a Pulitzer material. Um, so, and of course, Dick Costo, and he's like, well, Kara, I can't believe you did You know, Dick did his whole, like, whole yeah. neurotic thing. Um, and he's like, I can't believe you did it. Mm, but that was funny. <laughs> but it was, it was the idea of standards. Like, we don't have standards. Yeah, you we know, don't we have standards. Have, and we, we have and standards, but it's only when it, it never is brought up when it comes to work. Right. And, it, and we have standards, but it, it doesn't happen until the shit hits the fan. Right. We've all seen that in the boardroom recently in, right. in tech companies. We will get to it, but I mean, there's all the buts. I mean, the, my favorite but is, you know, I don't know. I don't know of any good women. To right. Okay. Board. That's Explain my favorite. Explain what but. you're doing at, at Allraise. Al yes, at Allraise. Uh, so Allraise is kind of a, a, a new nonprofit for the tech industry that was started 
last fall. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and hopefully everyone here, if you're interested, can become a member. We're going to be rolling out membership. It's, it's exciting. I think, you know, we're talking about not complaining. And obviously, there's lots to complain about. But what's exciting about All Rays and Board List and a lot of things that Megan's been doing is, like, this is about people in an industry who understand an industry. In our case, it's basically the most senior women in venture capital and in, in tech venture capital in America getting together and saying, we've got a problem in our industry. What can we do to fix it? Uh, the the data is terrible. We've heard lots of personal stories about people of color and women and people who are different having bad experiences. And it, it's not been a level playing field. I think we all now acknowledge that it has not been. So what are we going to do about it? And so a bunch of women, probably almost a third of the senior women in the industry, because the industry is really small, got together for dinner around a dinner table. And we talked about what are the problems that we can try and fix in our industry. And we came up with two specific goals that we thought would move the needle most. One is doubling the number of senior women partners in the venture industry and doubling the number of women that get venture funding that are co-founders of venture-backed companies. And if we can move the needle on those two things, we can change our industry. But, and so then, but rather than just throwing down those goals, we actually then brainstormed, okay, what are the programs that we're going to put next to them? What are the products that we can build? And let's just start shipping stuff and trying stuff. And so we started a thing called Female Founder Office Hours that has gone super well, and we're expanding it by stage and by city. And then we launched something called Founders for Change, um, in, which is around founders galvanizing around trying to work with modern funders and to basically modernize their cap tables and make their cap tables and their teams more diverse. Um, and we've been trying a bunch of different things. Uh, and so it's, I think it's pretty unique where it's not about like playing gotcha or penalizing people for the past. It's about moving forward together and teaming up and trying to change an industry from within. And you're raising. Yes, we are open for business if you want to contribute right. to allraise.org. <laughs> right, we, for what, for doing these different programs? Yeah, it's a, it's a nonprofit, we're hiring staff. And we're working on scaling so that we can leverage lots of volunteers, support programs, and basically try and ship a bunch of different products that will try and address lots of different members and touch points in the industry. And Megan, you're doing stuff around um, very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're doing stuff around around the country, trying to find talent. So explain what you're doing. You're also involved with Times Up, correct? Mm -hmm. And try and bring tech into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just overall to frame this issue, I think this is the moonshot. I mean, if you could actually field the whole team of the whole country on things that they wanted to work on, can you imagine with these amazing tools and tech that we have? So um, when, I've been working on a lot of different things, and, and we worked at Google for a long time on this and, and earlier. So, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of jobs open in the United States, and it's going to get more. You know, it's going to get bigger and bigger. So one of the things we're doing, Leanne Pittsford, who created Lesbian Institute Tech, created the Tech Jobs Tour. So I just joined up with her. We went to 25 different places across Appalachia and um, Milwaukee and Birmingham and Memphis. There's 45,000 young people out of school and out of work in Memphis. And there's open jobs. And so why aren't we bridging this talent? And so we found that it's not really about sort of conferences and talking about it. How about just hustle? You know, and so we would just go in and run a career fair in the evening and find the techies in town because they're always there. I remember President Obama was going to Boise, Idaho, and there were 15 tech meetups in Boise. One of them had almost 800 people in it. So there's lots of techies everywhere. They're just invisible to their neighbors if we're outside of Silicon Valley. So how can you get people meeting each other? So we've started to do that, speed mentoring that. And then you find people who are diving deeper. As a specific example, there's a guy named Nick up in Idaho, and he's a boomerang, which is one of us from one of these centers who's gone home. He's from Coeur d'Alene, he wanted to be home. So he's opened an incredible space, ADK bought basically a warehouse downtown, turned it into the coolest tech center. They've got amazing startups, they've got coffee, they've got all that. And then he's like, how do I get the rest of my neighbors in this state in? And he actually organized teams, five different teams, to go across the state to 20 different locations and run kind of, um, kind of try, try out this coding thing. And they ran 57 events in three days. I went to the Indian Reservation in Plummer, where there's 1,000 people living, 40 people showed up. We had uh, you know, iPads and Spheros. And uh, people were there, whether it was this forestry guy who wanted to digitize stuff for his business, or whether it was grandma and grandpa and the grandkids. And after this event, 700 people in Idaho signed up to learn to code together. Apple came, and we were doing Swift. And so now there's like book clubs in Idaho of those 700 people, 32% of them make less than 20K. Half of them are women. And, they, and Apple is showing up by video to mentor them in. So there's sort of this hustle way, and it's happening all over the country in the Mississippi Delta, uh, across the board. We were in Appalachia mm -hmm. and, uh, and Pikeville, tiny town. We're driving by 
the Coca-Cola bottling uh, facility and we're thinking, oh, that's cool. And then we're like, oh my God, of course, the tech company's in the cool building. Mm -hmm. And so they had founded a company called BitSource. This is coal miner entrepreneurs who had made many companies in the coal sector who have transformed to BitSource, drill bit source code company. 800 people applied for those 12 jobs. And their first job was learning to code. Now they're reshoring jobs to America in Pikeville. And also, I love their culture. They're Silicon Holler. Yeah. You know, they don't have Silicon Silicon Valley, Valley. like That's awesome. I, mean, I got to say, combat. I wish they would stop all that stuff, but okay. Yeah, but, but I love the, the point of it is just yeah. the, that it's this kind Appalachia culture together with now tech, advanced tech, great stuff. I mean, they had the fabulous ads diagrams that we know from Google all over the wall and also celebrated their own history. So what do you think the problem is I I export? What, here in, so first, let's talk yeah. about what the problem in Silicon Valley is. Let's identify from your perspective right now because, look, nobody could ignore all the Me Too stuff and all the stories. You know, I think Uber, for, for, for a company, brought it into full, and we're going to talk to Jara later about that, full, like, oh my God, this is the worst place on earth kind of thing. And, and Susan's memo really did, but it'd been around. We had had the Kleiner Perkins thing before, we, lots of things. How do you, and you were at Kleiner Perkins also, um, where, what do you, I want you each to identify sort of the problem from your perspective, of, because it has to really start in Silicon Valley or within the tech industry. The problem, one problem? One of them. Well, pick, pick, <laughs> there's like so many. Um, you know, the venture capital has been for decades a private industry of small firms run by white males. And they've hired white males and they've funded white males. Um, and it's the good guy problem, right? So, I mean, and, and you look at the data and, and people say, like, where are the women? Well, the women have not had a shot from the beginning. Um, you know, if you look at the money that goes into startups, all male female team, like all female teams get 2% of venture dollars, okay? And um, founding teams that have any female at all on them are, get 10% of the dollars. So it's 90% of the dollars are going to all male teams. And it's just, there's, there's bias. I mean, any of you who is a, is a hiring manager or runs a company, you know in all your business processes there are biases, right? And so we need to kind of systematically map out our industry and our business processes and try and take the biases out of them because the, you can't look at the end result and be like, oh, it's their fault. You know, like people have not been given a shot and we need to kind of re-engineer our business, but that's what's happened, at least in the venture world, is that like good guys have hired and funded good guys. And so, and other problems? Uh, well, and also, to be honest, sexism as well. I mean, mm -hmm. like kind of the layer below good guy is not getting looked in the eye when a woman is pitching a male venture capitalist. He's looking somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. There, there's really interesting data out of uh, some researchers in New York that's showing, uh, it's from TechCrunch. Mm -hmm. They took all the videos of the pitch competitions at TechCrunch and they looked at the questions that get asked by different, to, to different people. And they found that the questions uh, that go to women are usually decelerating. H how, you know, how are you going to hold on to your market? And then the questions asked to men by and far were like, how big is this? Mm -hmm. You know, they were accelerating questions. And, and people were raising far different amounts of money because of this. And they found that the good news uh, in terms of solution making is that this is happening. Our culture is doing this. None of us created this. We inherit it, right? But we're doing it. So we got to stop. Good news is that uh, they also found in the data for the women who could catch the negative question and say things like, you know, and turn it around, answer it, but turn it around. For example, uh, actually the market share is growing, so even if we're holding a, pie, a slice of the pie, we're still going to be larger. Here's how it's big, whatever, however they do that, that that can happen. We have to train people for that. But it's incredibly depressing. You look at the data, the reality, the truth of this. And, uh, you know, we just, we, we use media. One of the things we're doing in Time's Up is actually, and, and a lot of this work is people are starting to use actual software to help ourselves. So the KPOR Center has been pitch competitions around HR tech, people ops tech. You know, we do have mitigated bias. We can run, uh, let's say that we have a job rack going up, we can run it through some tools to help us broaden it so more people apply and it's less sexist and racist in its biased way. In Time's Up, we're using AI and machine learning and natural language processing on what we're putting on screen. Today, it's 15 to 1 boy programmers to girl programmers in children's TV. That's worse than the industry. So every time our children are watching TV, they learn boys do this and girls don't. And that's just not true, but it's the bias of the Hollywood person who didn't mean to animate or do that. So how can we give tools as you're making this media that you can see you know, who's not talking to, who's more central, really cool stuff that's coming out of USC, working with Gina Davis and others. That's part of sort of the screen, the screen team right. in Time's Up. So on a more pragmatic level, yeah. so we all, I mean, we've talked a lot about systematic bias and 
I'm with you. Um, but at a, more, at a more pragmatic level, I think that we are in an industry that has valued speed above everything else, mm -hmm. right? And the reality is to fix these things, to, to create a better pipeline, to fix your board. These things require intentionality, slowing down, and actually taking your time. And so, yeah. I mean, at the more pragmatic level, we may all not be able to change our biases, but then it takes intentionality yeah. and to set aside the time to do the basics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is the basics, right? The basics on building a pipeline. The basics before you go out and hire a great white male for that direct report job you have as the CEO of a company, why don't you just stop for a moment and look at the level below and figure out if there's a woman you can groom for that job. That takes intentionality. So I feel like systematic bias is like, it's daunting, right? You're like, wow, how do we all fix our biases? But like one below that is the pragmatism of like, okay guys, we it takes inten intentionality and time. We published this thing in the White House, I encourage everybody to look at, which is called Raise the Floor, because we would walk in the room and people were like, oh, I don't know what to do about this. Well, we know a lot. You know, we don't know how to totally fix it, but we have a lot of practices in the area of leadership, what leaders can do, in the area of our culture. You know, Susan Wojcicki always talking about what are we doing for the people who are here right now? Uh, what practices can we do? Like an example there would be feedback, making sure everybody's getting feedback, not just the person who gets invited to lunch. Uh, what can we do in our pipelines and what can we do in our ecosystem, including children? And stopping ourselves from saying, hey, we've got to work on diversity. What are we doing for the kids? Yes, computer science for all that work, let's go. You know, we, Wyoming just passed that. Chicago, you can't graduate from uh, school without having coding. So that will bring us a lot of equity, but they're not coming right away. So let's do that. And what are we doing for the people who are right here? And why, like Evan was saying yesterday, why is this not on the management team meeting every single week as a standing item? And how are we not crowdsourcing from our employee resources group so, better? So for all of you who worked in the industry, it does seem daunting. Daunting is an excellent word for it because it doesn't, I've been around for a long time. This does, it seems to be the same thing. Was the Uber thing a moment? Like, like you had Harvey Weinstein for the, for the, as a moment. There's yeah. all kinds of things, you know, and that's an appalling story. And we've had versions of that, not quite that level of horror show that he was perpetrating, but awful stories. Where do you imagine that? Do you imagine this is the, that moment? Do you or not? Because I thought it would be with Kleiner. I thought it would be a lot of stuff. I thought that was it. Quite. Yeah, I did. I, I know. But where did you, was the Uber thing many, that or the Kleiner, stories? Ellen Powell was very brave to stand up to Kleiner and that was a start. Uh, Susan Fowler's memo was a start. I think binary capital and I mean, Justin Callback and like, there are a lot of women who we know who were impacted by those many years of mm -hmm. right. bad it, experiences. Yeah. So and, did it take an apple cart? Um, Absolutely. There have been many, like, you know, better up. Gamergate, um, yeah. or better, sorry, better works. Yeah. Sorry, not better. <laughs> um, you know, there have been many, uh, SoFi, like we've just, like last year, it was like every month there was a new story where it just, you could no, no longer ignore it. And, and what do you imagine the impact? The impact, because sometimes yeah. it feels like the story's gone and then you get, it goes like this. I think, like I am, I mean, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm pretty optimistic, because I also think, like, you know how, um, researchers of, of kind of demographics say that Gen Z and millennials have different values than baby boomers. Like the, the way that consumers, younger consumers think about brands is different than how people who are baby boomers think about brands. Like younger people care about like, where was this made? You know, is it organic? Do they pe treat their employees fairly? Like they have different values. They care about brands in a, like a much more holistic way and a 360 way than I think prior generations have and I think actually like the impression that people have of Silicon Valley of kind of like the hoodie wearing bro who only hires his bro friends and kind of cruises around San Francisco in a pack kind of like assessing women is a stereotype that actually is really the minority now in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. I think like the, one of the benefits of all the shitty things that we learned about last year is that a lot of founders read those stories and they were like I do not want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want to build that team, or I don't want to lead that kind of a company. Like what? And they sit with their staff, and they sit with their board, and they say, like, okay, let's never be this. How do we change things up? How do we build a great culture? How do we, like, you know, I've sat on boards where, you know, a, a CEO without prom prompting will say, hey, we're 15 people now, and we're all guys. We're at risk of building the company that none of us wants to work at. How can you help us change who we hire next and make sure that we build the kind of company that would make us proud? And that's the conversation that is happening in so many 
um, boardrooms right now and in so many companies. Like the, the customer has changed. And so I think actually the firms will change too because this is like, and one of the things we talk about at All Raise is, is this is about motivation by greed as much as if, if more than fear in a lot of ways, yeah. like that people don't want to lose business. They don't want to lose customers. They don't want to lose talent. And they will lose all those things if they actually don't build a great culture and a, and a, and a team that looks like a modern company and a modern team. So greed rather than fear. Yeah. Although fear is excellent. I think as as fear has worked as well. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, both. Like, but I would say last year, you know, the reason I think it's tipping point that we're not coming back from is because, as you know, this is a small world. We all live in it. We can all walk out the halls and you know, three quarters of the people in this room, reputational loss, even more than financial loss, yeah. is a driver for behavior. I mean, yeah. so I think actually loss and loss of reputation, I mean, I think those were the drivers and the catalyst. So I think there's greed on the one hand, like I want all the available talent, and I don't. Yeah, and I think there is absolutely fear of repercussion because for the first time there were repercussions. Because there are repercussions. Yeah, absolutely. It, I, I was dealing with someone, someone at Uber. I was dealing with, and we were writing that India rape story, for example, which I was so I couldn't oh. believe when we uncovered that. Um, and someone said casually, "When are you going to stop?" And I said, "When you stay down." And that's when I'm, you know, when you can stay on the ground, like don't get up again because I'll hit you again kind of thing. And it was really, and it worked. They're like, oh, and I'm like, no, really, I'm going to hit you again. Get up, go ahead. And it was really an interesting thing. But what, what it was is what I felt like it happened is that it was more like, are, are you going to keep at this? Mm -hmm. Are you going to keep at this? So how do you sustain that, you know, the idea? Because you're not a Rachel, but like anger, I think, is a very effective thing. I think staying angry is an excellent way to, to, to create change. But it really, for, for the future, it doesn't, it doesn't motivate the groups of people you want to motivate. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, feeling like you have to pet these people, like good job mm -hmm. for not like grabbing that woman's ass, nice work, <laughs> mm -hmm. is really irritating. Like, I, think there's, I think there's two things. One is I think, um, I think it was shocking for everybody in a bunch of ways last year as this came out. One dimension was that all the women, we all know that this is true and this has happened to all of us at varying degrees. And I think for a lot of men, some men are doing this and a lot of men were surprised and, uh, and were, didn't realize how widespread this is and how extreme this is and how oppressive it is. And I, I think that that was a reckoning moment for us. Now, I have to tell you, I was talking to my sister-in-law who um, worked with Stallman at the beginning of open source and you know, in her work, in Boston, the beginning of this industry, she had to sit at her bench. She's an exceptionally talented electrical engineer, computer scientist, and had to have a Hustler magazine centerfold for two years until she could get rid of it. And if she took the elevator, people would attack her in the elevator. That was just the behavior of those people and no one was checking it. So we've come somewhere. Um, although I would admit that it's pretty amazing to think of Grace Hopper and Ada Lovelace and all the inventors. You know, Ada's the inventor, the Darwin you know, of us, she wrote a 55 page paper in the 1840s about computer science that she couldn't even write. She had to attach it as notes and write AAL like JK Rowling to hide that she was a woman. But really if you read it, it's the definitive paper that Turing references. And so we don't know our history. We don't know that women and men have gone to do this. You know, Turing of course makes a Turing machine. He goes to do the Manchester baby, which is their first computer. Ours is ENIAC and UNIVEC. And who works in his company but Berners-Lee, mom, Tim Berners-Lee's mom is the computer science there, and then she teaches her son, he makes the web. So women and men have ping-ponged along in this, and so we have to know that history because it drives the future. So I'm hopeful about a lot of things. The thing that I'm personally focused on is not only raising our consciousness about caring about this and getting it into the boardrooms and into the leadership rooms and the real tools that we have and understanding the cost that it has for our society. You know, I think sometimes from government, when we were in there, we were applying all this cool stuff to NASA and Department of Energy. Like, why weren't we in justice and in HUD and in ed? And why weren't we over there? And we started to do that work. But, you know, tech is for anything. Why should the Hogwarts tools be just for Steve Bannon and the dark arts, right? And, and then uh, so, you know, so for this and not for everything else. So you didn't stay in the Trump administration at CTO? I didn't get invited to, okay. but I would like a CTO to be there you know, someday. It's really so, important. So and, and just a fast thing about what Mark talked about this morning is fabulous. It's not going to take a lot more money to solve this. We have all the money in the world. The tech teams are not in government at the senior elite levels. Of course, not in NASA and NIH, but I mean in the, in the key places in Congress. And so taking a tour of duty is really important. And applying these things, these incredible tools, to justice and poverty and these other areas and helping those teammates who are extraordinary, harder problems. It's harder to solve poverty than drive a car down the street by himself. 
And so teaming up in these Navy SEALs team with us included will actually go a long way. I call it techifying yeah. everything else. Mm -hmm. We'll diversify Let's tech. Let's finish up talking about solutions and then we'll get questions from the audience. Like if you all had to change one thing, because I think you're absolutely right when you're talking about men, not men, a lot of good men not realizing it. I think every woman, woman I know has 10 stories of different microaggressions to very serious stuff. And not everyone's down on the serious end, uh, but everybody has yeah, one. Everybody has a story. And most of the men I know didn't know about it. Like, yeah. oh, I didn't, if I heard I'm so surprised mm -hmm. one more time, it was shocking. It was sort of, it, it was, it was like, also, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> but, but if you're not paying it. But then I thought, why aren't right. the women saying it? Would, talk about like one, each of you, one solution. So you're doing always for training and bringing people. Helping uh, women feel so what more can supported. People hear? What, yeah, I mean, go to allraise.org. Um, and we're just getting started. We're an early stage startup, but yeah, it's an opportunity for professional development for women, for mentorship. And this is just women, not people of color, and more because right, we're starting with women. Um, but it's down the same avenue. And uh, and I think we'll have lots of stuff. I think it's it's going to be hopefully a very big tent where, regardless of who you are, if you're on the mission and you want to make a difference, you can become a part of All Race. So uh, I'm beyond stating the obvious, which is, you know, get yourself some great women for your board. I'm going to go to the next level, which is I think one of the solutions for every leader in this room is figure out how you're going to make the next five women in your organization CEOs. You want to change Love or that. founders. You want to change this game. We need to take the talented and smart women who are sitting in all of your organizations and you need to make it your personal mission and people of color. Yeah, but take, it's not just that. The training right. part, I've known so many people who get in there and then they're, they move nowhere. Yes, but, yeah. but you know, it's interesting, right? Just a side note, I, you know, everybody thinks women need training and people of color need training. Like, I, I will say, Silicon <laughs> Valley, once again, is for all of us who got opportunities that none of us were qualified for. So this whole idea that you need to train women leaders and you don't need to train men leaders is ridiculous. <laughs> Let me just say that. Like, yeah. go find the talented women in your organization and talented people of color and make it your personal mission to take those high potential leaders and get them into the CEO seat or the founder seat. And that's how you will change this game. Get them into power. Yeah, so um, the thing that I think about is about leadership here. And uh, one of the big challenges is that this just isn't prioritized by leaders. Even, if, of course, we all care about this, but we're not caring like the way we're shipping the product. And so we just have to move the priority up, put it on the agenda, understand the basics, like, we, like again, raise the floor, what can you do? And, and also remember that that incredible diversity leader you have in your HR department or whatever, they're the coach. They're not supposed to do all the work. It'd be like being in the NBA and the coach was trying to play all the games. Like you have to have everyone on your team doing this at yeah. all levels. Because this, this is a team sport to include each other and it's uncomfortable. And get ready for that. And you're gonna learn a lot. And can you imagine how incredible we can be when we do this and the problems we will solve? And, and if you start thinking about market failures everywhere, across all topics and what you could address and making sure that as you do this work, you remember that we're all complying to a style compliance of the rules. Open it up. How should we, let's have fun at work. Like who thought of the dumb idea, don't cry at work? Or like, let's get rid of all this stuff and let's be ourselves. Let's have fun and let's solve the most extraordinary problems. We got climate coming at us. We got AI, we got algorithmic bias. We're gonna scale all this stuff and we have extraordinary people. So the real moonshot is how do we unlock the talent of our seven billion colleagues on the planet and bring it on what we could be as humanity and where we can go on and off this planet. Well, that's a good way. Questions from the way. audience? I want men to ask questions, Our please. Hello. Up, 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 men, or I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> I operate with fear. <laughs> I know a lot more about you than you think. Katie. Okay. So please Hi. rise. I do not Katie. want only women up there. Kate, go ahead. Yes. Um, so earlier you were interviewing Brian Chesky of Airbnb, and when someone from the audience asked him if he was looking to hire women on his board, he kind of grudgingly said, yes, we're looking to hire two women for diversity's sake. And to me, this sounded pretty ingenuine and problematic because he was looking at like it seemed like he was looking at hiring women like some sort of checklist he needed to fill out for diversity's sake. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you find this problematic, and if so, how do we change this mode of thinking? Just to be clear, that's my niece, by the way, Kate. <laughs> um, nice. But, Good um, question. And she's playing out your point because she's a centennial. Exactly. Right? So exactly. she's demanding yeah. this. Let me just be clear. I, 
text him almost daily, where are the women on your board? So I may be part of that problem. Um, but, uh, but, but go ahead. You guys go. Yeah, so um, look, uh, I think there is some level of I need a woman on my board because everybody says I need a woman on my board. Um, the converse of that is, look, if pressure right now in the ecosystem is what's making you think about diversity, I will take that over zero progress. Yeah. Um, and I think the most important thing we can do for Brian Chesky and everybody else is help him find the most talented people for his board, of which they may be women, and, you know, and don't stop at one. Get to two or three, and then let's go talk about the effects on his board. Because I think I'd love it for not, it not to be a checklist, but I will, take, I will take a checklist and peer pressure over no progress, sadly. Hi, my name is Orchid Bertelson. Um, thank you so much for having this panel. You guys are all badass. Um, so my question is really around what Megan was saying about doing your tour of duty, of bringing tech to solve problems in justice and poverty. I live in San Francisco. It's no secret that homelessness is a huge problem there. Um, you also see a lot of innovation and focus on um, creating apps or products for high net worth individuals to sell more products and make their lives easier. What do you think, what are the kinds of incentives you think should be in place so that the people who have the skills and who want to do good in the world can be incentivized to create and um, focus their energy on solving complex problems like poverty, um, but that don't, uh, you know, make them a lot of money, I guess. Right, right. So, yeah, so um, I'm in the National Academy of Engineering, which President Lincoln started, and uh, it was amazing to me to look at their agenda because it's the same thing, this lopsided, the treasure, the agenda, and the voice who gets to speak is on certain problems which are important. I mean, self-driving car, precision medicine, uh, ad tech, like there's stuff that's good to work on, and there's these other things. So I think one of the greatest things we learned um, with President Obama, Dennis, and others was that there's extraordinary colleagues using other tools. I call it play the whole orchestra. So they're using this part, and we're using this part. We gotta get all this stuff mixed up. So one of the greatest things you can do is not throw something at them, but get inside their team. So how do you put technical people, I call it TQ, like tech IQ or tech quotient, TQ people at the table. Um, when we were in, in these nonprofit government places, in tech, the engineers rule. And then somewhere down here are the policy and comms people, you know, and it's, it's our stack rank. I don't agree with it, but it's what we do. But when you go to government, the policy and comms people are in charge, and there's various other skills, surgeon generals and scientists and others. The tech people aren't even in the room. And so we get things like healthcare.gov because the, uh, these people are doing the right thing on policy and those choices, but their architecture's wrong. So I think it's who is missing from the team, not what to do. So, and, and add the people into those yeah. rooms. Use your philanthropy dollars to get technical expert people and help them hire them in these other sectors. But at some point, they're just not gonna have to make as much money. I was talking to someone who's thinking about this, who's so well, it's so ridiculously, obscenely wealthy. I don't know if I should do this. And I was like, mm -hmm. you're so poor, all you have is money. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they did it. Hi, uh, I'm not a man, but this is a guy-like question. I see one back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but. Here's the thing. Um, <laughs> I see that guy. <laughs> oh, I'm Martha Josephson. Here's the thing. I want to be one of Eileen's good guys. I want that opportunity. Um, I wonder if we should try to be that or if it perpetually sends the wrong message. Oh, like... Oh, Martha, she's such a great gal. Let's. <laughs> but, like, I feel like I would rather someone say Martha's so smart, or Martha's right for the job, the great for this job, or she would add she would add value. Like what Regina was saying, it's not about culture fit; it's about culture add, right? It's like she would add a lot to our conversation. That is should be the right. Let's not dumb down the answer to fit like the low like, level that we live at today. Let's elevate the. Like the conversation. And let's help each other do it. Yeah. We're going to get through all of these quick. Uh, I'm Carla Monterosa. I'm the CEO at Code 2040. Yay. Uh, Yay, um, Does everyone in this room know Code 2040? Yay. 2040, majority, minority in America. Everybody. Thank you. Um, so uh, when I talk to the other diversity and racial equity CEOs, we are all sensing the slowdown from companies and their commitment to purchase the products or invest in the things that need to be invested in in order to make these initiatives like real initiatives. and. I'm curious if you've also sensed that and like, how do you discern that shift and how do you incentivize it to be different in particular in a moment when 
we no longer have an administration that is moving social capital to incentivize this. Okay, short answers, we have to wrap up. I don't know if I have a great answer. I don't, I actually don't see Very it. Very short um, I, I mean, interestingly, in my business, I'm actually seeing an acceleration rather than a deceleration. So, uh, but I would say the long-term answer to this is to appeal to greed, not loss which means we need, we need more Katrina Lakes, we need more women yeah. kind of at the very top, we need more women on boards in order to keep this like the pull. an incentive. We need a pull, like yeah. the push is not enough, right? That's my kind of macro yeah. thesis. Yeah, and I think you, you always have to look for stuff that's working, you know, instead of like, oh my God, this is exhausting. These are hard problems, but there's stuff that works like you guys and others, so find them and just help them. That's the best path. That's how we scout, you know, for seed, it's the seed round, go find it. All right, Mossberg, if you can be sure. I only have a quick, I have one more question. I have a question, but I'm going to defer to Walt. Defer to Walt. Very quick, Walt, because I'm getting, like, mean messages from Peter. Well, that's bad. Um, <laughs> I, I've been there. Um, I want to ask about a sort of collateral damage thing that's happened as, as the Me Too stuff has, has come out, which is that men who still have most of the power and most of the institutional knowledge in many companies have become afraid to mentor women. The uh, backlash. Huh? The backlash. The backlash. In other words, and H some HR departments, according to what I read at least, are advising men, don't, be in a, don't take a woman to lunch alone. Don't close your office door and talk to a, a woman that you want to mentor. Um, I think this is a terrible thing, at least until we get to, how do we get to balance? It's part of transferring this knowledge men sponsoring women, not because they're men, but just because they have the power. How do we fix that? All right, very short answers. I agree, Sorry, I guys. it's a terrible thing. I think women, I mean, men should not be afraid. And I think what we talked about before, like we, I think we did ourselves a disservice by shielding men from the conversations and the stories and the experiences that a lot of women and, and people who are others in organizations have. Like ask, ask a colleague who is a minority in your organization, what is it? Like, can we talk about your experiences? Like, and be open, have those conversations, and take risk about, to get someone, get to know someone that you don't know. Um, I, I don't. We're definitely not going to solve this problem by men saying that they're afraid to meet with women. Yeah, I think you can also get creative. Like, take two people to lunch. You know, like just get get into. If you feel nervous, take two people or three yeah. people. Go in a group. Find others. I think you can do that. <laughs> You're not. Yeah. I know, but it's important. And the other thing that's really important for all of us in general is remember. Uh, that the people who are the most left out are the women of color. Yeah. Uh, and so making sure that it's not, yes, it's, uh, it's the, it's, you know, 50, 50 men and women on the planet. In our country, it's 40% people of color. It's five to 10% gender nonconforming LGBTQ people. And from Time's Up's perspective, we're always working on those, those kinds of numbers to have everywhere. And so as you're going to mentor, you know, go find that group. And no Mike Pensing in any of you. You yeah, got it? Right. No okay. Mike Pensing. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much, you guys. Sorry we have thank to go. You. We have a lot more questions. I apologize.